everybody it's um it's really good to see you all again i hope uh, you've all been keeping safe and well in the uh the interim period uh, since our our last gathering and if you're new to these uh, seminars it's really good to have you with us too um we hope you enjoy tonight's subject which is edith stein um also known as saint Teresa benedictor of the cross um, who was a German Jewish philosopher and later became a discount Carmelite nun. She wrote her doctoral thesis on the subject of empathy at the universities of Göttingen and Freiburg and her studies were briefly interrupted in 1915 by a period of voluntary service as a nurse. Afterwards she worked for two years as an assistant to her doctoral supervisor Edmund Husserl. Her attempts to establish herself in an academic career as a philosopher were not successful because she was a woman. While other avenues had started to open for women, academic philosophy was not one of them. Thankfully, that has now changed, of course, and uh, we are delighted indeed tonight to welcome the Reverend Dr. Stacey Rand, who is a senior research fellow at the University of Kent and uh, very much um, a, a, a trailblazer of female academia. Um, and her Research focuses on family care, community-based social care, and social care outcomes measurement. She has herself been an associate of the Third Order of Carmel since September 2012, and is part of the Carmelite Companions of the Way, which is an ecumenical dispersed community. And she's also currently an MTH student at the Carmelite Institute of Britain and Ireland. So who better? to talk us through the life and thought of Edith Stein, St. Teresa Benedict of the Cross, than Dr. Stacey Rand, who I commend to you all this evening. Welcome, Stacey. Thank you very much, Father Chris, and uh, thank you for a very kind introduction. Um, as Father Chris was saying this evening, I'm hoping to share something with you um, about Edith Stein, her life, and particularly her later life in her vocation as a discalced Carmelite nun. And in the talk, um, where are we going towards is really to look at her later writings, her spiritual writings, um, that go are around the theme of the cross and the way of the cross. Now, before I start, I think I do need to add a disclaimer or two. Um, so as those of you who are listening carefully to the introduction, you will have noticed that I'm not a philosopher. And some of you here may have studied or read Edith Stein through that particular lens. Um, but unfortunately, this is something that I'm not going to delve into this evening. We will touch on it, but that's not the focus. And likewise, some of you may be coming here knowing something about Edith Stein's contribution to um, feminism and um, the women's movement in the 20th century. And again, she wrote and contributed to both of these areas, but that's not a particular aspect I'll be drawing out. In the introduction, you will have heard that my background is in um, social sciences. I'm a psychologist by training. And I think it's because of that that my interest in Edith Stein is in the overlap between her interest in psychology and also spirituality, particularly Carmelite spirituality. And I think because of that personal interest, that's going to really be the focus of the talk. And I hope to share something with you this evening. So to begin the talk, which is going to be in three sections, I'd like to just give a brief outline about Edith Stein and her life. And this is because I'm um, aware that some of you may know about her already, but for some of you, this might be the first time that you're learning about her. And I think it's important to know a little bit about her life and her biography to really understand her. So Edith Stein was born in Breslau in Prussia in 1891. And she was the youngest of actually 11 children, so quite a large family. And um, they were um, boys and girls, and Edith was actually the youngest of them. We've got some photographs here. So the photograph on the left-hand side is a picture of Edith, um, who is on the right-hand side, with her older sister, Erna, on the left-hand side. And then on the other side is a picture of um, the family with Edith sitting in the middle, um, looking rather proud and um, resplendent in the midst of them. Now, having grown up in this family environment, part of a large family, um, as a young woman, she had an ambition. She wanted to go to university and she wanted to study philosophy. First of all, she didn't actually leave home. She started her studies in Breslau, which is um, her hometown where she studied history, psychology 
and philosophy. But in her study, she came across a book by the philosopher Edmund Husserl. And in 1913, she was so intrigued by him, she actually went to where he was, Göttingen University. And the plan was to go there for a semester, to meet him, to understand and to learn some things, have a good time, and then go back to Breslau and finish her studies. And we have a wonderful account that she wrote later at this time, and you really get a sense of Horizoning's opening for her as she grows and learns new things. And actually in that encounter, um, it suddenly was clear that this was her passion. So the stay of a semester actually became where she stayed and went on to do her doctorate. Um, her doctoral supervisor was the same philosopher, Edmund Husserl, which she completed in 1916. And actually after graduation, she carried on working with him for two years as a graduate assistant. After that time, she continued for another four or five years working independently as a philosopher. And then, as also today, academia was quite a difficult um, field to get into. You had to spend quite a lot of time in a slightly precarious position before you got a formal academic post. And so Edith was working away, trying to establish herself, applying to different positions, but sadly, none of those worked out. And as Father Chris said in the introduction, that the main reason was um, that she was a woman. And even though there were cases of contemporaries to Edith Stein who did make it, um, notably, for example, there were um, women in positions in mathematics, um, particularly philosophy was an area that was seen as close to women. So we can see on this slide here on the left hand side, a photograph of her doctoral supervisor. And on the right hand side, um, we read the closing of the reference that her doctoral supervisor wrote for her. The rest of the reference is very positive and glowing, but he ends with these words. If the academic career path were open to women, I'd have no reservations in warmly, warmly commending Edith's application. With that, I think he was making it very clear what he thought, um, a position that might seem very strange to us. And thankfully, um, something that's changed quite radically as academia and scholarship has um, thankfully opened to women now. But Edith obviously came up against these barriers and realised that she had to find a different way ahead. Importantly, in this phase of life, she was exploring something else. She was starting to learn about the Christian faith. Now, as I mentioned earlier, Edith had been brought up in a Jewish family and she'd been used to celebrating the festivals and following the customs within her family. But actually, when she went to university, she went through a phase where she moved away from that. And through her own words and accounts of this phase where she moved away from faith, she rather wryly looked back and described it as her enlightened phase. I think what she was really trying to point to there is that um, she went through a phase as a young woman where she was thinking that you couldn't possibly be someone who thought and um, studied, someone who was an academic and also be a person of faith. So she went through this phase where she felt like she had to reject that faith part of her. But actually, and thankfully, she came across colleagues and friends who were Christian and who were open about that. And she started to see how it was possible to have a mature faith and to be a person who thought critically and rationally and to combine the two. So the culmination of this, or perhaps one might even say the beginning of this was in 1922 when she took the step to be baptized and confirmed in the Roman Catholic Church. Shortly after this, she took a position as an instructor at a teacher training college in Speyer. And during that time, she lived alongside um, a, a convent, um, a group of Dominican nuns. It's interesting to read accounts of this period of her life, and it sounds like it was quite an austere time. Um, she followed in the life of the convent, um, and she spent a lot of her time working, and even in her spare time studying and writing, again, pursuing her interests in philosophy. Actually, she was also very much in demand as a speaker, giving talks and public lectures. So she was quite busy with her work in this phase. 
we then find is that eventually she gets an academic position, the one that she longed for. So in 1932, she took up a position in Münster, which is in northwest Germany, um, a university and cathedral um, city. And um, we, can, we don't know from her own account how she felt, but we can imagine that she must have felt a moment of fulfillment in finally having made it. But sadly, only shortly after she started, she was dismissed. Um, and if we think of the time in 1932, 1933, this was the time of the rise of the Nazis in Germany and with the restrictions and um, people of Jewish background and heritage were actually barred from academic positions and so Edith also lost her job. Now that may sound like it was a very difficult thing to happen but actually for Edith it was also an opportunity. Since she'd been baptised and confirmed she'd really had a very strong draw, a desire to enter the religious life. And so in um, being dismissed from her post, it was actually a chance to pursue that interest and her vocation. And so um, that's exactly what she did. She um, entered the Carmelite Monastery in Cologne, which is near Münster, and started her formation as a nun. And we can see the pictures here of this time in her life. Um, on the left hand side as she um, professes and enters, and in the middle her wearing the Carmelite habit, and on the right hand side again her wearing the Carmelite habit and standing next to her is her sister Rosenstein um, who followed Edith becoming um, baptised and confirmed in the Catholic Church and becoming a lay Carmelite and actually living as, alongside her in the convent. And so the culmination of all of the formation in Carmel was in 1938 when she finally took um, her final profession of vows, her life vows. And from this time onwards, she was known, and earlier actually from when she was entered, she was known by her religious name, Sister Benedicta of the Cross, or more simply, Sister Benedicta. So just very briefly, for those of you who don't know about um, Carmelites, um, the Carmelite community, or the discounted Carmelite community that Edith entered, um, practiced what is known as enclosure, as do Carmelite uh, monasteries with female religious today. And what that means is that the um, monastery is actually closed to the outside world. Those who enter um, make a commitment to step away from the outside world, to enter into a space where they can focus in prayer and they have time for that contemplation. And the picture you can see here is actually from a Carmelite monastery here in the UK, Quiddenham Carmel in Norfolk. And you can actually make out the bars at the front, which is at the gate, which marks the enclosure as you look into the nun's chapel. Now this commitment to enclosure may sound quite extreme. So we have to kind of look back, I think, to the origins of the Carmelite order to really understand what it's about. So we have two pictures here, two icons, which help us. On the left-hand side um, is a picture of the first Carmelites. So these were 12th century, a group of 12th century hermits, all men, who gathered on Mount Carmel in the Holy Land. And it's believed that they were former crusaders and pilgrims who then giving up their journey and their traveling came together and you can see quite nicely in that icon, if you look in the background, there's some little caves with some of the hermits in there, either working or reading or praying. And in the middle, you can see a bishop. It's actually a patriarch, um, Albert of Jerusalem. And he is giving the Carmelite rule, the rule of St. Albert to one of the brothers. And this Carmelite um, rule is also what governs Carmelite communities. Um, through the ages and also today it's a very important document and in it very importantly it says that um, those who enter the Carmelite way of life should meditate on the law of the Lord day and night staying in or near their cell so there's something about withdrawing to make space for prayer and this idea this concept is very much at the center of the Carmelite charism as it's lived by nuns um, religious living in community now, in many ways, what I've described this life of enclosure um, may sound like a flight from the world. And it, in some ways, it could be seen like that. But actually, Carmelites have 
a very strong sense in their vocation that they're separating themselves from the world, but their vocation, their life is offered on and behalf of the world. So their main um, charism is praying and praying for other people. And that's something they take really seriously. And particularly they like praying for priests. So those of you here who are priests, if you meet a Carmelite nun, and um, she asked to pray for you, be very blessed and um, joyous in that, because that's really central to their vocation. Now, of course, we return to Edith Stein and she's entered Cologne Carmel and it's an enclosed community. And in some senses, she's apart from the world, sheltered from it. But on the other hand, she can't ignore what's going on around her. 1930s Germany, as we all know, saw the rise of National Socialism. It was certainly becoming very clear that it was not a safe place, a safe country for people who are Jewish or were from a Jewish background. And Edith Stein would have been very aware that she was in danger. Her community actually were also very aware of this and there were plans to make sure that she was safe. So what they did in the background was they arranged a transfer for Edith to move from Cologne over the border into the Netherlands to a Carmel at Echt. And so Edith made that journey along with her sister Rosa Stein. Now, of course, as we all know, that safety wasn't very long lived because the Netherlands was then also invaded and it was occupied and Edith was once again in danger. And we know from the records of this time that further efforts were made to secure a place of safety for her. Um, there were inquiries made about moving to Switzerland or to um, a Carmel in the Holy Land, but sadly those didn't work out. In 1942 in the Netherlands, the Catholic bishops took a stand. They publicly spoke out against the Nazis' per persecution of Jewish people. And in retaliation for that, there was a wave of arrests. Um, they arrested Dutch priests and religious of Jewish background. Um, accounts of this um, estimate that there were somewhere between 280, but others have said up to 900 were arrested in that act of retaliation. And among them was Edith Stein and her sister Rosa. Directly after that, they were deported. They didn't know where they were going, but were sent east. They stopped briefly at Westerbork. Um, where there were eyewitness accounts of their journey and then continued. And it's um, known that they continued on to Auschwitz and it's believed that they, along with those travelling with them, were murdered upon arrival in the gas chambers there. Now, that very brief biography and particularly the ending is perhaps quite a lot to take in. But I'd like to suggest that Edith Stein has a lot of richness to offer, much more than the details of the beginning of her life, the bits in the middle, and also her ending, that very horrific ending. And I think that the richness that's there is when we start to look into her life, into her spirituality, and into the way in which she lived. I think fundamentally, Edith was always a philosopher. She loved philosophy, loved studying it. She loved the rigour and the depth of thinking that she was able to engage in. And I think importantly for her, in this, what she was trying to do through what she was studying, what she was writing, and also how she was living, was to create a coherence and integration into her very being. Now, I've got here um, a little quote which is taken from an article written by Edith Stein's niece, Susanna Batzdorf Bieberstein. She writes, for who she really was, for who Edith really was, how she lived, that will forever remain her secret. The reason I've shared this with you is I think it's quite poignant that even a family member writes that Edith was someone who was slightly mysterious and unknowable. In the same article, the niece shares other memories of Edith. There's some really nice details of the family and the aunts together and of Edith being very playful, a warm person, quite personable, and yet at the same time being perhaps a little quiet and withdrawn. And um, Susanna, the niece, talks about the way in which Edith would sometimes disappear, perhaps to go and write in her study or to visit friends. But there was something about, even for the family, 
it was difficult for them to really grasp the completeness of EBIT. And I think that this is important because whatever perspective you take from eyewitnesses of people who knew Edith, it's very difficult to grasp the whole because she was a person who had many different facets and aspects to her life. And I'm hoping that that's something we can now spend a little bit more time looking at. So in this second part of the talk, I'd like to move perhaps a little bit away from biography, but again to look at Edith Stein's life, but through the lens of the topic of formation and spiritual development. And I'm hoping that this will then help us in the third and final section of the talk as we approach Edith's writings about the cross to make some of the connections that we need to. Now, when it comes to formation, um, some of us, um, particularly those in ministry, will have come across the phrase, um, the journey of faith or faith journeys. Um, there's a bit of me that hopes that this has now fallen out of favour because I think it's become quite a terrible cliche. Um, but I think in thinking of that term, it shows us something, it points to something that might be helpful. It's showing us that formation is something that is an individual narrative, a journey that a person engages in. But actually, at the same time, it's a communal journey. It's the communal journey of the church um, in this time, in different geographies and over time. And there's something of the interplay between the individual and the communal. Now, what I'm hoping to show is that Edith Stein's biography shows us that it's possible to take the individual narrative and coherently think about the person as they are in the world in the reality within which they are. And to also think of the way in which there's an openness to that, a coherence, a generosity, connectedness, but that is also rooted in the communal narratives of Christian faith. So if we think about for Edith, her journey into Christianity was one of integration and coherence. For many people, particularly for family, they didn't see it that way. But for Edith, really importantly, becoming a Christian was not a break with her identity, her Jewish identity. She still saw herself as of her people, but also a Christian. And as I say, this was actually quite difficult for some of her family members to accept, and particularly Edith's mother, who um, found the whole thing really quite difficult. Likewise, some of Edith's academic colleagues also struggled with it, but for Edith, importantly, there was a connection between, there was some kind of integration, and that for her, what she was doing was living her life in fulfillment and bringing it into coherence. To help us a little bit more with this, um, I think it's good to look at Edith's own description of what happened. Now, it's often cited if you read biographies of Edith Stein, um, this little story about Edith talking to her friend, the philosopher Hedwig Conrad Martius. And Hedwig asked Edith to explain her conversion, why she became a Christian. And Edith's reply to that question was this phrase in Latin, which means, the secret is mine. Now Hedwig um, later wrote about that. It was something that was picked up on and written about in um, biographies quite early on, but Hedwig wrote in 1958 the following. It's no easy task to talk about Edith Stein. It's perhaps impossible to make any kind of adequate remark about such a person as who is so particularly and exclusively focused on the religious realm. The inner life of such people remains a secret of God. So was Edith, later Sister Benedicta of the Cross, an unusually closed and unknowable person of a hidden nature. It's therefore very right that the words, the secret is mine, that Edith once spoke to me, are found in all of her biographies. I think there's something really remarkable here, and I know that it's certainly um, a story that really touches me, because what we're seeing is that even though Edith remains silent about the inner depths and in her experience, she knows that she actually probably can't speak about um, the depths of which she's experienced, that she remains unknown and unknowable, but at the same time, she could see that she was growing in coherence. Her path as a Catholic laywoman, as a Carmelite nun, was a coherent step and a continuity. 
And all of this was done in growing knowledge and friendship of God. Again, if we want to look a little bit deeper into this, if we're talking about continuities, um, I think it's helpful to look at some of Edith's writings and to look at the continuities over time. One of these is this book, um, Life in a Jewish Family, which Edith wrote when she was in Echt Carmel. And um, it was actually something that she did in her spare time as a relaxation activity. Um, but importantly, it was actually also an act of defiance. At this time, it was clear that the um, Nazis were persecuting Jewish people, dehumanising them. And Edith wanted to talk about her background and her experience of living in a Jewish family and showing the humanity and the um, way in which that family was just completely ordinary. And so this work was what she created. And there's some really wonderful insights into it about how Edith still felt a very deep connection with her family of origin, even though in her path in life and at this particular point she'd left and she'd actually gone into enclosure and would have had very limited contact with her family on the outside. Importantly, as I said before, the key thing is, is that Edith was seeing this as a continuity. It was not that the step to become a Christian was a break with what had come before, but that it was an increment, that they both came together and that they were both interweaving in her life and in her vocation. Another aspect of her thinking and writing, which I think shows quite a nice continuity and coherence, is Edith's development as a philosopher. Now, her area of study is a branch of philosophy known as phenomenology, which is the study of conscious experience. So philosophers working in this area are really interested in things like um, vision, hearing, um, things like memory and emotion, empathy and intersubjectivity. So you can see almost immediately that it's a area of interest that overlaps with other areas, um, obviously psychology, um, but also natural sciences, particularly neuroscience. And I think it's quite important to acknowledge that this branch of philosophy has been really important, you could almost say fundamental to the development of social sciences, the area in which I work. Now in Edith's doctoral thesis, which um, the book here is actually the published version of that on the problem of empathy, is a work in which she tries to address the problem of how one individual or an individual is able to know another individual. In the work, which is quite complicated and in depth as you'd expect in a doctoral thesis, um, what she does is she develops the idea of the individual beyond the concept of the pure eye or consciousness to take into account mutual exchange of individuals and mutual exchange of information between individuals, which she calls empathy. And I think it's important to note there that she's not using the word empathy as we would in every day, but it's about that exchange of information between people. In this work, Edith begins to ask questions around the relationship between the individual and also the transcendence. And she then goes on to pick this up in later works. Now, as I said earlier, I'm not a philosopher. And in that very brief portrait, which I've glossed over many things, what I'm really trying to show and to draw out is that Edith was really interested in people. And not just people as individuals, but people in their relationship with the world, their relationship with each other in groups, societies, even nations and also the relationship with the transcendent. And this is a continuity that you see right the way through her thinking as it develops and moves into spiritual topics. Again, if we want to trace something of Edith's um, formation and spiritual development, I think it's important to look at an incident that happened um, in 1917. Edith Stein had some close friends, the philosopher Adolf Reinach and his wife Anna. The photograph here shows Adolf Reinach um, at his desk, um, ready to read. And along with many other young men, he was sent in the First World War to go and fight. Sadly, at the age of 33, he um, died on the battlefield at Flanders. 
Edith heard the news and was naturally completely distraught, very upset. And knowing that Anna would also be very upset, Edith sets out to go and visit her. Now, Edith expects to arrive, meet with Anna and to console her or try to console her. But actually what happened was Edith turned up and Anna was relatively composed. And Anna even began to comfort Edith. The tables were turned completely different to what she expected. And this experience made a really profound impression on Edith. It was a moment in which Edith described that she encountered something of the power of Christian faith, but she knew Anna was a Christian. And something of the power of the cross in transforming human suffering and grief, almost a moment of transfiguration. So Edith later, thinking about this incident, wrote about it and she had this to say. It was my very first encounter with the cross and the divine power that it bestows on those who carry it. For the first time, I was seeing with my very own eyes the church born of the Redeemer's suffering, triumphant over the sting of death. That was the moment my unbelief collapsed. Of course, this is a retrospective interpretation, um, one that's theologically informed, and we don't know how Edith really responded in the moment, but it clearly had a very profound effect on her. It clearly changed the way in which she was thinking. And I think it's really actually quite interesting as well in line with her later vocation to Carmel. But what was going on here is that Edith was recognizing something in Anna, Anna holding something of the gift, the divine gift, that um, is able to take a situation of horror and suffering and to turn it into something of strength. And in recognising that, Edith too has something, has an encounter with divine gift. There's an exchange going on. And um, that's something that links with Edith's interest in philosophy and phenomenology, but also is a theme that comes across in Carmelite spirituality, which we'll pick up again later. So in all of this, I hope what I'm showing is that Edith's development was something of a coherence. Um, there were continuities going on and it was something that didn't happen in a vacuum. She was in dialogue with events um, in her life, in the wider world, and particularly influenced as all of us are by the relationships with friends and colleagues. And all of this, of course, was important for her formation. But I think what Edith did with that is really remarkable. Edith grasped something that she had discovered about the cross and something about God's ongoing work and salvation in and through the world as it's unfolding. And this truth was something that Edith held on to really quite tightly in the midst of all of life's ups and downs. Um, when we hear of her biography, obviously there were disappointments and setbacks. And yet Edith was able to carry that with her in um, quite an open and generous way. And there's something really quite remarkable in that. I think this quote shows us something about that. So Edith wrote to a friend in 1928. I realised that something else is asked of us in this world and that even in the contemplative life, one may not sever the connection with the world. I believe that the deeper one is drawn into God, the more one must go out of oneself. That is, one must go out into the world in order to carry the divine life into it. And I think here, even in 1928, so this was a time before Edith became um, a Carmelite nun, you can see very clearly the influence of Carmelite thinking. The vocation of the Carmelite is to bear the gift of God's love or to receive it first of all, importantly in prayer, and then to bear it to other people and um, carrying it out into the world. And this is something that's really important in the Carmelite tradition, and you see repeated again and again in the writings of the Carmelite saints. So some of these you may be familiar with, but we have the 19th century um, French Carmelite nun, Thérèse of Lisieux, who wrote about the little way and doing things with great love. And so she was talking about the way in which we engage in the ordinary, the everyday, the little interactions. 
then there's something of God's love in that, that you receive it in prayer and then share it with other people. There's also um, Brother Lawrence of the Resurrection, a 16th century um, French Carmelite friar, um, who wrote The Practice of the Presence of God, which is a very small book, and if you've not read it, I would really recommend it. Um, and essentially what this very simple work shows is um, his sense of living his vocation, of being aware of God's presence in the very ordinary things he was doing every day. He was assigned to kitchen duties, something he didn't really like doing, and yet used that as an opportunity to become profoundly aware of God's presence. And the final example I'd like to give you, though there probably are more, is St. Teresa of Avila, who very famously in her work, The Way of Perfection, written to her nuns, her sisters, she encourages them to find God walking among the pots and pans. So it's that image of being in the kitchen again. And so even though there's this very kind of lofty ideal in Carmelite contemplative prayer of encounter with the divine and receiving something of God's love, there's also a really deeply ordinary aspect to it. And that it's always um, a movement out into the world towards other people rather than a withdrawal from it. And that quote from Edith, which I'll just go back to, I think that quote from Edith really shows that nicely, that this spiritual life isn't about um, cutting oneself off as an island, but it's about deeper and deeper connection with the world around us. And um, I've, I've put this picture in here because I like it very much, but it shows um, a kind of like novice at work and I, I think that that's also very important to um, be aware of the place of work in the Carmelite charism. There's something that grounds and keeps people um, looking at the ordinary and always thinking about how the vocation is lived in the here and now. And again, linking back to Edith, I think that this was something that she was growing into and very clearly growing towards in becoming a Carmelite nun. So having tried to give um, both a biography and then a description of her um, faith development and formation, in this third and final section of the talk, I'd like to spend some time looking at what Edith had to say about the cross, living in the way of the cross. Now, as I mentioned earlier, when Edith became a Carmelite nun, she took a religious name, Teresa Benedicta of the Cross. And as with um, most religious, the name was picked with an intention. Uh, in fact, actually, I think some religious communities, the name is assigned, whereas in Carmel, there's an element of choosing. So you can choose something that means something to you. And so to briefly describe the influences, I've, I've put some pictures onto the um, slide. So we have, first of all, Teresa, and in the top right-hand um, corner, you can see a picture of Teresa of Avila. 16th century Carmelite nun. Um, and there's actually a talk in this series about Teresa of Avila, which if you haven't seen, um, I really warmly recommend it. Um, and she was a figure who really influenced Edith Stein. Again, another one of the stories told about Edith Stein's early um, thinking about Christianity is a story that Edith went to go and stay with a friend and she discovered a work by Teresa of Avila, the interior castle on the friend's bookshelf. And I don't know whether this is true, but it's said that she took the book and she was so engrossed in it, she read it very quickly and afterwards declared that um, this is truth. So there was obviously something that deeply resonated with her as a philosopher and in her growing formation and development and awareness of spirituality. So the second part of her name, Benedicta, relates to St. Benedict of the Benedictine tradition. And at the bottom, you can see a picture of um, a Benedictine abbey in South Germany that Edith had a really strong connection to. In fact, it was where her spiritual director was, um, the director who actually urged caution about her entering Carmel too quickly um, and was very influential in encouraging her in her life as a lay Catholic woman, in her speaking and writing and thinking. And this connection had quite a profound influence on Edith Stein, and I think that she was wondering whether the Benedictine way of life was for her too, even if she eventually um, discerned that her vocation was really with Carmel. And finally, we have the name of the cross. And 
Um, this is part of the Carmelite tradition that Carmelites tend to take a part of their name which shows something of the mystery upon which they will ponder in their religious life. Um, so we have John of the Cross, who also took the name of the Cross, or Elizabeth of the Trinity. And for Edith Stein, she also, like John of the Cross, felt drawn to take that. And you can see the picture in the middle of the Carmelite nun moving her habit, the part called the scapula, the apron, to reveal a cross there. And that's something that Carmelite nuns um, do. They carry the cross close to their heart. Um, so even those who don't take off the cross as their name, it's, it's very much part of the Carmelite vocation. And so what we know of Edith's time as a Carmelite was at the beginning, when she entered, she clearly saw this as a kind of break. She knew what entering religious life was going to mean, and she didn't expect to be treated any differently from the other novices. And I think it's important to remember that by the time she entered, she was later in life than was typical. Most novices would have entered in their 20s and um, no allowances were made. She followed the same programme as everyone else. So she engaged in ordinary tasks and housework and she followed the same formation programme. And in this, she had expected that she would never again um, study philosophy and write. But actually, um, and thankfully for us, she was given that space by her superiors. I think they recognised that she had a profound gift and that it would have been a shame to have not given her that space. And so we have a series of writings that she wrote in her time as a Carmelite nun. And I'd like to pick two of those just to focus on and think a little bit about her writings on the cross. The first of these is a talk that she wrote for the Exaltation of the Cross, the Feast of the Exaltation of the Cross, which we've just celebrated 14th of September. And the talk was given in 1939. So to understand the talk, I think we need to note two things. First of all, the day. So the Feast of the Cross is um, an important part of the Carmelite calendar. It marks the beginning of quite a long period of fasting. So it goes on from the 14th of September until Easter. And it's also traditionally the day on which Carmelite religious renew their vows. The year, I think, is also important. So 1939, um, we're obviously in a period where society and the wider world must have seemed quite oppressive, um, particularly to Edith, and being aware of what was going on for her people at that time. And in being invited by the prioress to write a talk for this occasion, I, you can see that what Edith does is to bring the themes together into some kind of conversation. And in writing the talk, um, it's quite remarkable, I think, that Edith Stein doesn't really hold back in expressing what she thinks. And if you look at the talk, the language is really quite bold. So she talks about the Nazis as followers of the Antichrist people who desecrate images of the cross, those who make every effort to tear the cross out of the heart of Christians. And she speaks with sadness about people who once, like us, had the cross and followed after Christ but had fallen away because of their influence. In this, she also picks up a phrase that is really alluding to um, something written by Teresa of Avila many centuries before. In the way of perfections, Reza of Avila um, uses the phrase, the world is in flames, um, as a way of marking the urgency or highlighting the urgency to which her and her sisters ought to be called to pray for the world, a world that's in turmoil and chaos. And it's this phrase that um, Sister Benedicta in the talk um, picked up and then used it again and again as a motif. So we have here a little quote. The world is in flames. The battle between Christ and the Antichrist has broken into the open. If you decide for Christ, it could cost you your life. Consider carefully your promise. Taking and renewing vows is a serious business. <laughs> I think reading this, it's really quite bold and more remarkable when we reflect on what is known about Edith Stein as a personality, a character. 
I mentioned earlier her family described her as playful, those who knew her talked about her being quiet and friendly. Um, but in, even in her professional life, she was known as someone who was quite calm and measured. When she gave lectures, she was described as someone who stood at the podium and didn't move about too much and spoke with a calm but quite small voice. So to think of her writing and then conveying this is really quite remarkable. But I think it shows to us the passion with which she was considering her vocation and what it meant for her in that particular situation. And particularly reflecting about the way in which following Christ and deciding for Christ can end up placing us at odds with the power and authority of this world. I think there's also something of that boldness that comes across in another um, situation that Edith found herself in. And I find this quite remarkable that she was so defiant, but there's an incident where she was um, in a situation where a member of the Gestapo came in and greeted her and other sisters with the Hitler goose, the Hitler greeting. And um, rather than replying, Edith Stein just came out with praise be our Lord Jesus Christ, the traditional Carmelite greeting. And um, I think the sisters around her were quite dismayed and the superior took her to one side and asked her why she'd done that. And she said that she just couldn't contain herself, that she felt that she had to speak for the truth of Christ and in allegiance with him as a Christian. And I, I think all of this is really quite remarkable in, again, thinking about her as a character and then seeing how she was reacting, certainly speaking with boldness and prophetic voice into quite a difficult situation. But again, back to the talk. If we look at the talk, it develops once again and begins to look at a different way of thinking about the Carmelite vocation. And in this particular quote, um, Edith's developing a line of thought from another Carmelite saint, St. Therese of Lisieux, um, and particularly developing the idea of the vocation to Carmel as something that's less about doing, but it's more something to do with being. So not to do with what we act and do, but who we are, how we are. So the quote is as follows. Do you hear the groans of the wounded on the battlefields in the west and the east? You are not a physician or a nurse and you cannot bind up the wounds. You are enclosed in a cell and cannot get to them. Do you hear the anguish of the dying? You would like to be a priest and comfort them. Does the lament of the widows and orphans distress you? You would like to be an angel of mercy and help them. Look at the crucified. As you are bound to him by the faith and observance of your vows, your very being is precious blood. You cannot help like the physician, the nurse or the priest, but you can be at all fronts where there is grief in the power of the cross. Your compassionate love, which flows from the divine heart, takes you everywhere. Its precious blood is poured out everywhere, soothing, healing and saving. And again, that's a very powerful um, piece of rhetoric from this particular talk that again is picking up something of essence in the Carmelite charism, but I think speaks very profoundly into the situation in which Edith was. So it's referring to the war, the First World War, and also the ongoing um, Second World War, and this desire to want to be useful and helpful, and yet the vocation of Carmel to be a presence of prayer, praying for and on behalf of the world. So, in this very last part of the talk, I'd like to briefly um, also look at another work that Edith wrote, which was um, on the subject of the cross, um, a book called Kreutzer's Wissenschaft, The Science of the Cross. This book um, was written slightly later than the talk that I've just shared. And what happened was the, um, in that particular time, they were coming up to the 400th um, anniversary or centenary of the birth of another Carmelite saint, St. John of the Cross. And Teresa Benedict was actually given the task and some time to do it, to write a book for that particular occasion. And um, so she set about her work. So here is um, sharing a picture of John of the Cross, who I'm sure many of you are already familiar with, um, but just to focus our thoughts. So what Edith set out to do was to um, perhaps not write a biography 
But to do something perhaps a little bit different, this is a work where she's trying to synthesize something of different parts of her life and bring them together. So she takes her training as a philosopher and particularly the methods of phenomenology and applies it to John. Now in phenomenology, um, what you try to do is you try to study an object, in this case, John, a person, and you try and set apart your assumptions and you try and gain fresh insights by looking with new eyes at the subject. And so that's exactly what Edith Stein tries to do in the work. So it's neither biography nor commentary, but she's trying to gain an insight into John's doctrine by understanding his life. And there's something about the title, The Science of the Cross, that she's trying to convey. It's a book that's about the knowledge of the cross and not knowledge that's academic or head based but knowledge that comes through a life lived in and through the cross. And this quote, I think, captures this really nicely. The science of the cross, it's a theology of the cross, a living, effective truth, buried in the soul, like a seed that takes root and grows, making a distinct impression on the soul, determining what it does and emits by shining outwardly, is recognised in its very doing and emitting. In this sense, we speak of the science of the saints, and a science of the cross. And again, I think that really she's developing something, oh sorry, just to go back, she's developing here, I think quite a nice thought, which sadly I don't have much time or no time at all, so we're nearly out of time to elaborate on, but I think it links really nicely with last week's talk by Paula Gooder on Paul, in which she was talking about the ethic and Paul's ethic, the way in which faith is lived out I think what Edith is doing here is exploring that living out of theology in the everyday and exploring that, which I, I think for her time um, and place was quite an interesting thing to do. And I think it speaks really nicely to us today. So to end, I'd like to share this very um, slightly longer quote, but then to draw things together. So in the same work, um, Edith says the following. When Jesus says, whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me, or if anyone wishes to follow me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me, then the cross signifies all that is difficult, oppressive, and what is against human nature, that taking it upon oneself is like a journey to the death. The disciple of Christ is to take up this burden daily. Therein lies a silent challenge to respond appropriately. The appeals to follow the way of the cross of life provide an insight into the appropriate response and at the same time insight into the meaning of death on the cross. To win eternal life, disciples must give up their earthly life. They must die with Christ in order to rise with him. The lifelong death of suffering and daily self-denial and even if necessary, the death of a martyr for the gospel of Christ. I think this quote is perhaps um, interesting and difficult for us maybe to read because we know what comes next in Edith's own life story and in the lives of other Christians or other people throughout the world and across time. But I think it presents us with a challenge. Edith speaks of the silent challenge to respond appropriately. I think it really speaks to the core of what it means to be a disciple. And you could say that the quote really isn't, or even the wider work, which this quote, I think, illustrates. The wider work isn't particularly original. It's talking about the call to take up the cross in terms of martyrdom or perhaps the ascetic life of the religious life. And these are quite well established themes in Christian writing and thought. We don't begin to see perhaps later developments in theology that have been a bit more critical about these understandings of taking up the cross and following, particularly critiques that look at the way in which this concept has been used to oppress groups that are marginalised um, in society or in the church, and that includes women. And that, I think that's interesting because Edith was also thinking and writing in this way, but she didn't go down that particular line. But I think it's remarkable to read this when we know what happened in Edith's final days the eyewitnesses who saw her on that journey towards Auschwitz speak of a woman whose presence was really remarkable. She was a person who held together something that conveyed calm and peace. 
um, eyewitnesses speak of the way in which she gathered children around her and cared for them, combing their hair, um, making sure that they were okay. And these children effectively having been either um, separated from parents or with parents who were too distraught really to be caring for them. And I think that this account shows something of just how remarkable um, Edith was in her character, a person of strength, a person of quietness, but inner stillness and of strength. And I think it shows how she lived right the way through, even into the midst of some really horrific circumstances. Um, her Christian faith and also her vocation in Carmel. And to finish, um, I'd like to, I suppose, comment on this in line with what Teresa of Avila, the founder of the Discalced Carmelites, um, talked of in her sisters. So Teresa of Avila um, famously lived through a time when there was censorship and um, she did have periods where her books were taken away and her works were censored. And she spoke really quite um, boldly about the way in which her sisters ought to become living books. So that even if the Inquisition were to take away her library, she could still have something of Carmel and the Christian faith around her lived by her sisters. And I think um, Teresa, and I'm hoping all of you would have seen something um, in what I've presented of Edith Stein, of this remarkable woman, and say that she truly was a living book in the Carmelite tradition and as a Christian. Someone who, whose example conveys knowledge of the divine and reflected something of the divine presence throughout her life and ultimately to its end. I think I've spoken slightly over, so I think I will stop there and um, just to say thank you very much for your attention. Stacey, thank you so much. That was uh, an absolutely uh, amazing uh, talk and, and what, a, uh, what an amazing, amazing life to be excluded from academia for dint of her gender, for feeling like her faith had to be sidelined in order to be considered reasonable, mm -hmm. for uh, losing uh, that small gain that she'd had in the early 1930s, but all of this ultimately perhaps leading to that, that vocation, that moment where she could be who she was called to be, that moment of exciting and, uh, you know, that, that moment of perhaps this is what it's all been leading to and I can, I, I can sense that that excitement to that part of her life, entering the, the convent, and, and, and here it is, this is the life in front of her. And then having to transfer out of the convent in order to go somewhere safe that didn't end up being safe, and her arrest, and her deportation, and her death. I mean, it's just horrific. Absolutely horrific. I don't think there's any other way to um to to describe it but to hear you talk of her coherence mm. to hear you talk of her i'm sorry her faith journey <laughs> um and and to hear about her focus on god her focus on the cross through all of this her inner peace and her inner calm her simplicity and uh, that that lived example, that that lived out example of her faith in the world is um, is earth shattering, and uh, she's not somebody I knew about before. You've really opened her up for me, so thank you so much for that. I think she offers us perhaps uh, a different perspective on our own concerns and our own worries of this particular time. Uh, gives us a rather different uh, perspective on our own concerns and, and worries. So before we uh, take questions, uh, which I'm sure are going to be fulsome and interesting as ever on Towers of Faith, uh, I'm going to tell you about our next talk, which is going to be with our very own Father Sam McNally Cross. And Father Sam is going to be talking about Thomas Merton. He's going to be talking about Thomas Merton and contemplation. And, and he wants to try and pull apart what it means to be a contemplative in a world that prizes business and activity. 
Thomas Merton was a Trappist monk. He was a prolific spiritual writer, a prophetic mystic, and he peeled back the veil of monastic life in the 1960s, which led to a blossoming of vocation. And in our next lecture, Father Sam will introduce us to the wayward soul of Merton, who found faith and Catholicism in spite of himself. And how many of us have found faith in spite of ourselves? And Father Sam will be seeing what it is that Thomas Merton can teach us. So join us on October the 14th for that. And we speak to Father Sam now as he takes your questions on the redoubtable, the amazing Edith Stein. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, thank you again for your attendance this evening at Towers of Faith. And Stacey, thank you for your talk. I'm sorry I missed the vast majority of it. I had a, um, a, a meeting that overran that I was summoned to, uh, but I look forward to catching up and learning a bit more about Edith Stein, who I've been reading a lot of in the last month or so. So uh, I look forward to catching up and thank you for, for the bit that I heard, at least uh, in the last uh, few moments. And um, Questions? Anyone? Uh, I, I can see most people on screen, I think, so please do give me a wave if you have any particular questions. Uh, I'm not sure if I can see digital hands, um, so if I don't see you, then feel free to unmute and shout at me. Um, anything at all? Anyone at all? Uh, Mark. Thank you so much, Stacey. Um, this question's a bit obvious in a way, but I suppose it, somebody has to ask it, which is what, it, what do you see as Edith Stein's contribution um, to where we are now? And I mean, some of that's about, is it QAnon and the, you know, the, the rise of the extreme right? Um, but also a situation in which it feels like some of the um, well-established landmarks are there no more. I just wonder whether you have any reflections on that. Sure. Um, there's probably quite a lot that I, I could say. Um, I think the um, talk in which I shared, the first talk that I shared with you where Edith was picking up this phrase, the world is in flames, and um, thinking about the way in that, which that echoed Teresa of Avila's use. And I think we could probably say the world is in flames this evening. <laughs> um, but I think despite that kind of repetition of acknowledging the chaos that goes on in the world and these perhaps troubled times that we're living in now, it's important to know that there have been troubled times in the past. And I think what I find most remarkable about Edith Stein is along with other saints of that period, those who went into concentration camps, who either died or survived and wrote about it. There's something really remarkable about the way in which they carried and carry that faith, even into the dark, darkest of circumstances. And um, I think there's something quite, I remember the very first talk I heard about Edith Stein, and I've got to admit that I got very caught up around the ending of her life. And, you know, there is something very horrific about that ending. And there's something we should be horrified by. But I think there also ought to be a taking a step back and showing the way in which she um, showed, in the words of another Carmelite um, saint of that period, Titus Bransman, that we're going into a dark tunnel, but there is light at the end. And the way in which she lived that through, that even in the midst of that journey towards Auschwitz, and I, I'm fairly sure she knew where she was going, that she held on, that faith was very much with her, and she still carried on showing that in the little acts of kindness around her. And the other Carmelite saint I mentioned, Titus Bransma, um, was actually arrested. He, he was someone who um, spoke out. He wouldn't be quiet, and he was um, called that dangerous little friar. And he kept um, speaking out, um, part of the Dutch press speaking out against the Nazis and ended up being arrested and taken to Dachau where he died. And um, I think his story is also remarkable, although he shows much more the human side of grappling. Um, there are moments where he almost gives in to despair, but that living of the faith I find really remarkable. And there's something where I... I <laughs> would hope that that's not something we need to kind of go into, but I think we ought to reflect and think about that. How do we 
show and hold on to that in our everyday, um, even when there's disappointments and turbulence going on around us. How do we share that and live that out in what we do and how we live and who we are? Thank you for that question and answer. Any other questions? Now you've had a little bit more time to think. Chief Father Sam, I, I have one. Uh, Stacey, how, um, at, at, at what point in Edith's writing do you think she, she perhaps started to understand what her, her future may may look like what her future may entail do you, entail do you think she had any any pre sense of what that ending may be mm, i think that's a really good question i'm i'm perhaps going to interpret that in a slightly different way but come back to how you asked it i th i think edith knew quite early on that her vocation was to be a car car like nun um, and it, in fact her movement into the catholic church was partly informed by this initial encounter with Carmel and I think the way in which it resonated with her thinking and what she was already noticing about um, the Christian faith and that, that very early story I shared about the encounter with Anna. Mm. Uh, so that's the way I'd kind of initially answer it. I, th I think to answer the question I think as you intended it, I think she was very aware of the danger she was in as was the community around her and I think it's important to note that it it wasn't that she was resigned to what was going to happen. There was a lot of effort put into trying to get her to a place of safety. Um, and I think that indicates, I mean, to transfer Carmel's is quite an unusual thing to do. And to have done it once is unusual and to have tried to do it again is very unusual. And so I think there were definitely efforts to get her to safety. Thank you. Just, a, just as a follow-up of well, what other people are thinking about questions, do you think that affected her writing? Do you think that, that, that fed into that, 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 either that sense of uh, knowing you're in danger, which, which, which was clearly there, or in the sense of knowing that your, your end is coming, do you think that, that affected her, her writing? It's interesting, because I haven't read her writings i'm not sure it did i mean the, the talk i shared with you from um, 1939 the, the two after are perhaps less bold so the first one is actually much more strident and prophetic the two that followed it are actually she was invited back the following year and then the one after it's actually toned down slightly and certainly in the science of the cross it doesn't necessarily come across in that way okay. um, I, oh, Sorry, are we going to ask a follow-up? No, no, that was me going, okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, a question from Elaine. Ooh, I think you need to unmute, Elaine. While Elaine's doing that, I just yeah, wanted that. to... Oh, oh, that's yeah, go, on. go on, Stacey, that's fine. Oh, I was just, just to finish in response to Father Matthew, I think it's interesting that her interest in the cross goes way back um, before. And I, I think that that's really important to notice that the interest in the spirituality of the cross isn't something that's morbid. It's something that she saw as life-giving. And certainly, um, and I didn't draw this out before, but I think part of the... Um, link she felt that she had with John of the Cross, for example, is that they both were nurses at points in their life. So John, as a young man, um, worked as a nursing assistant in the hospital, and Edith volunteered as a nursing assistant during the First World War. And there's something of that coming up against human need and caring that profoundly influenced both of them. So, sorry, Elaine, you're about to ask a question. I was very struck by what you said about um, Edith Stein's um, phenomenological approach um, and thinking to myself well that's very interesting in 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 this this polit political climate where everything is kind of bluster and and u-turn and change my mind at the last minute and you obviously in your work um, 
um, have the strict spiritual, not spiritual, the, the strict scholarly discipline, which you apply to policy, to social policy. Um, and I was thinking to myself, I wonder how Edith Stein's example can help us in the church to respond, um, but, you know, both to the political situation and also um, to the sort of paucity of spiritual support that we are um, encountering at the moment. Um, and somehow there is something important there, the way that Edith Stein turns to that approach, which gives her a voice of both authority and integrity, which I think is, is also a voice of, of prophecy. Mm. Um, and somehow we, we need that very, very badly, I think. Yes, thank you. You're certainly picking up on some really important um, things there. And I, I think that that does have a lot to say for us today. And certainly it was very interested in um, truth and the way in which phenomenology in her training as a philosopher was enabling her and others to be able to name truth, to see reality as it really is. And um, I think that's a very powerful tool. It can be quite scary, though, to see the world as it really is. <laughs> and I think there's something about the way in which she combined the rootedness in Christian faith and um, the kind of like emphasis on being open to God's love and yet being able to see the world as it really is and to speak that with prophetic voice. I think it's very powerful. Thank you. Any other questions before we draw things to a close? And I can't see any. So last call. I think we're there. Stacey, thank you very much indeed for fielding those questions and, uh, and for joining us this evening. And, um, thank you all to, to those who came and took part as well. Thank you. Thank you. And I look forward to next time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> thank you, everybody. Good night. Good night. Thank you very much.